Wait, this one needs assistance. I think that <laughs> it needs for you. rescuing. I think that one oh, needs. it's hot. <laughs> that one needs eating. <laughs> When staying in a vacation rental for the first time, all travelers have expectations. Expectations can range from good to bad, to accurate, to totally unfair. But whether we like it or not, those first expectations play an important role in the overall experience. If our expectations are met or exceeded, then we leave feeling thrilled. If they're not met, then we're typically left feeling disappointed, sometimes even deceived. And the same is true about destinations. Before arriving in Nashville, my expectations were really high. World-class country music, dazzling barbecue, and the Tennessee Titans. But I didn't know a whole lot more than that. My good friend Mary was gonna be in the area, and I convinced her to fly in and join me in seeing how those expectations would be met. The term vacation rental can mean a lot of things. But at the very core, it's a movement unlocking a whole new way to travel. For years, I've immersed myself in the community of people leading this movement. And I'd like to share with you their stories as we rediscover hospitality on a whole new level. My name is Matt Landau, and this is A Sense of Place. Welcome to Nashville. When booking a vacation rental, communication with the owner or the manager is so very important. After all, these are real people's homes, and welcoming strangers into that can be such a personal and courageous thing. This is such a beautiful house. Well, thank you. I arrived at 9 p.m. to find the great John Odin waiting for me in the doorway of Heike House, a three-bedroom contemporary ranch home located in a suburb about 15 minutes from downtown Nashville. I chose John's rental because of his reviews, all of which talked about the home's great value and how cool it was to live in a relaxed residential neighborhood. So you write a note to every guest, you, you handwrite a note to each guest, yep. and then you ask them to record their comments on the back. Yep. Exactly. And then you share these. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Incredible. I'm not sure whether it was John's southern hospitality or his fatherly way of carrying himself, which is strange because John doesn't have any kids. But the moment I arrived, I felt like I was home. Only this home had two bottles of warm sake to welcome me inside. John asks all of his guests for their favorite beverage and he gifts it to them upon arrival. It's one of those easy little gestures that makes guests feel special. And this is this comes at a cost to you. It does. I asked for sake, and sure. you have two very beautiful bottles of sake waiting for me. Right. How do you justify that cost? Well, that's no more of a cost than the cost of having the house here. You know, these are part of the, the package, and we realize that guests don't necessarily come just to stay in our house. They come for an experience, and that adds to the experience, just like any other uh, aspect of what we provide. So we don't see it as a as a cost, it's, uh, it, it's part of building that relationship and something that sets us apart from the hotel down the street. With two other vacation rentals and a handful of long-term properties that he manages and a full-time job in education tech, John does not meet all of his guests in person, only when his schedule permits, which is about 50% of the time. So these little touches are John's bread and butter costs of doing business. We've had a small portfolio of traditional 12-month rentals for many, many years. So I already had quite a bit of uh, experience in evaluating properties, buying properties, renovating, fixing properties, and have, have done that. It's been successful and we've enjoyed that. But uh, we started to see the, the trend toward vacation rental stays through Airbnb and VRBO and the other big platforms. And uh, we sort of got an interest in that and saw that that's a whole lot more fun than doing the traditional 12-month rentals. We can decorate the properties more nicely. There's more of a revenue stream there to support nicer finishes and uh, nicer places. So that uh, attracted us to that and got us started. And no one ever really trained you in that formally? No, no right. not, not at all. We just kind of learned as we went. And we found some great resources along the way, like you, and uh, learned tremendously from that. But as far as getting started, uh, we had been guests in vacation rentals and we 
know what we enjoyed and, and we saw what those hosts were doing and we thought was good. We found a few things that we could do a little better, we thought, and uh, that's kind of how we got started. Finally meet you. Finally meet you. You look too. like a real. I look like real? <laughs> yeah. Well, good. I'm glad I don't look I've fake. seen your website before, so wow. The next morning, I was so excited to finally meet John's wife, Ellen, who works at Vanderbilt University. Originally from China, Ellen's almost uncannily in her element in Tennessee. She's open, curious, and she smiles a whole lot. These are traits that make any foreigner successful anywhere they go. I invited John and Ellen out for lunch, which is such an easy thing to do with vacation rentals. Invite your host or someone on their staff out for lunch or coffee and soak up all the local advice you can. Their choice was International Market, a deceptively simple name for quite the unusual culinary establishment. The atmosphere of International Market is what would happen if an Asian grandmother took over your middle school cafeteria, wooden booths, paintings of elephants and Buddhas on the walls, and then there's the owner. You'll almost certainly hear her before you see her. <laughs> Patty Mintz is one of those entrepreneurs who you meet and almost immediately want to root for. Still working every day. Every day. You're open all, every day of the week? Seven days a week. Wow. And you've been in this location the whole time? The whole time. Wow. One spot and I have to say something. Patty's husband is a professor. Mathematics professor okay. at MTSU. Okay. It's very so smart. Okay. Yeah. So eating food here is also a secret to um, intelligence. No, I think he's smart before he eats my food. <laughs> <laughs> Having opened the restaurant 43 years ago, Patty's business became something of a landmark for John and Ellen, an institution that was as much a part of their weekly lives as any business could be. So start slowly, enjoy it, and uh, we start cook food for you. Thank you. Okay, so they're making salad now, and then uh, I have to make, um, they like my egg. I'm gonna make egg omelet for them, but you don't have to make eat. Make it, make it. Yeah, yeah, make make it yeah. egg. Okay, just only one. I'm the only one. Oh, okay, okay. We enjoyed huge plates of eggplant and chili, huge fried shrimp, rice noodles and mango with this delicious sticky rice. Yeah, okay, start eating and get some little rice in your plate. I will. <laughs> I really mean. I love you. Thank you. But John and Ellen's choice to bring me here wasn't without some nostalgia. International Market would be closing this year. Meeting Patty and her daughter Mao, seeing their obsession with watching people experience Thai food and realizing that this monumental project was nearing the end of its time, it got a little emotional for me. That feeling you get when small final gestures benchmark the story of something big. From the moment I left International Market, I told myself I'd come back before they closed the doors for good. Yummy! Yummy, yummy. A few days before I arrived, I had emailed John to ask if he had any suggestions for a place to get a traditional Nashville haircut. You gotta be kidding me, John said. I'm literally sitting in my barber's chair at this very moment. I'll make the reservation. So Mary and I rolled into Moose, a relatively unsuspecting home located smack dab in the middle of Music Row, our nation's most important musical thoroughfare. Music Row is just another Nashville curiosity. It's arguably the most cutting-edge production studio hub in the United States, behind Los Angeles. And yet, it looks totally unassuming, pretty much a normal residential street. When we arrived, we were ushered into a waiting room and served whiskey on the rocks while we waited for April Dixon, the owner who moved to Nashville from California with one simple and ambitious plan. Create the town's most unique barbershop. <laughs> This is a beautiful, beautiful barbershop. Oh, thank you so much. I've never been in a barbershop like this. Oh, that's awesome. Thank Reminds you. me more of like a really cool grandpa's house. That's awesome. Thank you. Together with her business partners, mom and dad, April took the family business from zero to 60 in less than 10 years. And to most people, starting a business with your family would be insane, especially one that involves liquor and straight edge razors. But the journey, has really solidified April's appreciation for the basics in any relationship, business or otherwise. Communication, respect, and good old-fashioned hard work. 
you're the barber, you're the network of all secrets through time. That is definitely true. You find out a lot. Mm-hmm. So do you have any juicy little <laughs> nuggets for us? <laughs> <laughs> to share with the world. Yeah. <laughs> John and Ellen are spiritual people. They go to church once a week with John's parents who live about 20 minutes away. So when included in the Heike House Traveler suggestions was the opportunity to help out A Room at the Inn, a weekly program pioneered by John's father that picks up 36 gentlemen from the streets of downtown Nashville and ushers them into a safe place for the night. I signed up almost immediately. It started about 30 years ago. I was a Catholic priest that had a small church near the river, and he came out of his uh, front door of his church one afternoon, and there was a bunch of homeless men in his parking lot. And he went down and asked them, said, uh, what are you doing here? And they said, well, we were sleeping over here under the bridge, and the police came by today, and they uh, made us move. So uh, we're here and uh, we're going to sleep right here in your parking lot. And he said, well, that's not a very good idea. He said, uh, tell you what, I'm going to make you some peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, uh, and I'm going to open the door of the church, and I'm going to let you men come in here and sleep. Uh, the only thing I ask is, don't burn the place down. <laughs> and he went home and came back the next morning. Uh, nothing wrong with the church. <laughs> and. Uh, so he thought, hey, this is a great idea. Why don't uh, I try to get some more churches? Uh, his name was Father Charles Strobel. And that was the start of Room at the Inn, and he's still with Room at the Inn. A warm meal, fresh laundry service, and clean beds. We do three meals here. Uh, tonight, they all eat turkey and dressing this near Thanksgiving. Uh, in the morning, we'll fix bacon and eggs. We can't do everything for them, but what we do for them, we try to do really well. Here, one of the things that we insist on is the volunteers to eat with the men. And a lot of people have a, a misconception about homeless people. They think they're just lazy and don't want to work, but that's not the case at all. We like to engage in conversation. We like to be good listeners. Uh, you have to think uh, about what are they doing every day. They are with ho other homeless men most of the time. Uh, they're talking, but nobody's listening. But uh, when they come to this church, and, and should be all the churches, we want to listen. Room at the Inn asked their guests to commit to better life choices and professional training and the accountability to solve their own problems. The experience made my visit to Nashville deeper and more meaningful. It gave me a new view on homelessness and a newfound appreciation for everything that I have. It was a private and profound part of the Odin's life, but it so perfectly fit in the scope of a visitor's meaningful vacation. And the really cool thing is that John was never really trained to offer any of this stuff to visitors. He began like most vacation rental hosts do, from scratch. Well, we started with one, and uh, learning how to set up the listings on the on the OTAs, the, the VRBOs, the Airbnbs, and all of that. Uh, a little bit of a learning curve there. Um, as far as interacting with the guests, that came pretty naturally. We knew how we would want to be treated, so we treated our guests in the same way. Do you look to hotels for inspiration? We do, and um, in some cases, I think you know, hotels have got a strong game when it comes to linens. Um, we get some favorable comments about our, the comfort of our beds and our sheets and people appreciate that, but uh, I've gotten into a couple of uh, hotel scenarios when, when you get into those beds, you're like, wow, this is something else. Yeah, I want that. Yeah, yeah, I want that. I want that for our guests. And some of it's the same and hotels have spent a lot of money and a lot of research figuring it out. So to the extent that we can learn from them, the aspects of their business that applies to us, it'd probably be a, good, be a good thing. And this is a really convenient time to mention our show's sponsor, The Bundle. This is a company with access to over 150 years of hotel experience and intel, now catering to independent owners and managers like John. Tools like this are pretty much made for newcomers who want to kickstart their vacation rental businesses up to speed. 
When envisioning what Nashville would look like prior to arriving, Mary and I assumed that there'd be some kind of country music district and maybe a cosmopolitan downtown, but what we didn't expect was a handful of extremely dynamic satellite neighborhoods, each thriving on their own, yet in a united Nashvillian sort of way. Downstairs from John and Ellen's chic apartment, for instance, where you can still get $2 draft beers in plastic cups and plenty of snark from the local bartender. Or 12 South, a hip little neighborhood where Mary and I bought vegan cupcakes from a pink automated ATM. Looks like a Vanderbilt logo. Oh yeah, that's a good eye. What's the other one? We Mary? just got two of the same ones. Oh, nice. So there's no... Uh, Should we try? No eggs. Yeah. Germantown was where we had lunch at Monell's at a big long table where we sat next to total strangers and shared some down-home cooking. Each neighborhood seemed so healthy and alive, and while many of the Uber drivers we'd meet expressed some concern that the cost of living was closing in on too expensive, they also loved Nashville desperately. And this is maybe a glue that seems to hold the rapidly changing city together. In fact, it's $2 Tuesday. They're $2 beers. Oh, wow. nice. Finally, we went to East Nashville, where I'd meet up with Kelly Reeves, an Inner Circle member and the mother of two genius behind the slightly off retreat, a nearby vacation rental that challenges the way we define hospitality. That's what this is, is slightly off retreat, you know, so that's what it looks like. Yeah, it's just a little too You guys want to do a quick tour? It was one of the most curious and unpredictable vacation rentals that I've ever seen. Kelly lit up her amphitheater, literally a handmade stage built at the bottom of her backyard as an excuse to host her local favorite artists. Kelly's so plugged into the music scene that we couldn't help but follow her lead to a self-proclaimed dive bar where in typical, unpredictable Nashville fashion, an incredible band was playing just for us and a few locals. <laughs> like I was in on a travel secret that many people had yet to discover. Here's a song about the hardships of the working class. It's called Times Are Hard and So Am I. <laughs> last stop of the evening was Nashville in a Bottle, a power punch example of how the people and the culture of Nashville isn't only confident and deeply rooted, but also young and innovative. Local American Legion chapter has nothing on American Legion post 82. We arrived just when things were getting started, and while the majority of my country dancing took place off the screen, the music was just outstanding. The mood in this place was also very approachable, like you could just be yourself without anyone judging you. It's Nashville's attitude in a drop. On our last night, Mary and I wanted to take advantage of our vacation rental and host a dinner to show our appreciation to the two generations of Odins that made our trip so special. Heike House's backyard was the picture-perfect setting for a barbecue dinner. Fall off the bone ribs and brisket and my new addiction, collard greens spiked with vinegar. I snuck out just before dinner back to the international market and convinced Patty to let me frame a piece of her restaurant's history, one that's slowly coming to an end, and to gift it back to my hosts 
you cherish Patty so much? It is the first article wow. that featured Patty from the newspaper. And she had this in her office, and she said this would be one of the most meaningful things that we could leave for you guys. Wow. Oh Thanks for that. God. That's precious. That so, is precious. So We're going to put in a prominent yeah, place. Yeah, and then we get a place of honor. Reflecting on what made our Nashville experience so special, Mary and I thought back to the day we first arrived, with admittedly high expectations, but of the obvious stuff, the stuff we'd seen on TV. And like most people who visit Nashville, we certainly got to experience all that. But on top of it, we were exposed to a second, totally unexpected layer to this place. In choosing to stay with John and Ellen, we got to know their Nashville. A city, a people, a style through their personal lens. This was a masterclass on the new power of hospitality that the best people and businesses and places a lot of times aren't predictable at all.